Hello everybody, so this is the lecture where we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about predation and the effect that predation has on communities. So this is kind of the part of the class where we start thinking about interspecific interactions. So how different species kind of interact with each other. And remember we're talking about interspecific, inter meaning uh, between different species. Intra would mean um, within the same species. But uh, how we classify interspecific interactions is by showing <coughs> whether the effect is positive or negative for each species involved in the interaction. So um, there's a variety of different um, interactions that we have. So predation, herbivory, and parasitism, these are all where, you know, it's positive for one, negative for the other. Competition is negative for both species. Mutualism, positive for both. Um, and these are, you know, what most people pretty much know about, but two of the less common or not as well known um, interactions are commensalism and amensalism. So um, that's where you have plus and no effect or negative and no effect. So when we think about these pluses and the pluses and the minuses, it's very easy to see that, you know, predation is uh, positive for one, one player in the interaction and negative for the one that gets eaten, right? Um, the predator gains the nutrients and energy from eating that organism. The prey obviously loses its life and loses everything. But for the purpose of this class, what I want to talk about is, you know, predators in a very general sense. I really am talking about herbivores here. Uh, really, herbivory we can think of as just predation on plants. It's generally, you know, non-fatal on a plant unless you have a whole, whole bunch of these herbivores can, like eating a plant and eating like the whole thing. Most um, herbivory react interactions, you have some ability for the plant to resist it. So really what we're talking about is any sort of consumer. Um, so we have primary producers and then the uh, consumers, the primary consumers are those herbivores. The secondary consumers are the predators, and then you know we get tertiary uh, predators, and these would be the like you know top predators in the terrestrial system, um, and depending on you know just kind of going up and up the food chain. Um, so pathogens and parasites are also in um, what well, you know when we're talking about predators and prey in this um, in this class um, really most pathogens function in a really really equivalent way to predators and they produce a lot of very similar dynamics so this is that classic data set where we look we've kind of uh, looked at this graph a little bit before where we see these in this interaction between hares and lynx um, and you know that there are these real big cycles going on. And that's the same thing we see with this parasite wasp and a weevil. So, um, and the weevil is its host, obviously. So, you know, there's um, definite uh, similarities between what we generally think of as predator prey, um, you know, herbivore and the plant, and then the pathogens or parasites and their hosts. Another thing, thing we should think about is that predation isn't always negative for the other party. Now, it's certainly negative for the thing that gets eaten, but it may not be completely negative for the like species, the prey species in general. So when prey are at carrying capacity, there's essentially no room for more species, for more individuals of the prey to um, to, to like, not too many babies are born, fewer babies are born, um, and so when an individual gets taken out of the population from via predation, it opens up that competitive space. So potentially you can get new individuals coming in. Um, you know, a real good example might be uh, for herbivores if uh, um, an herbivore comes along and um, takes out a couple trees in a forest 
that you know brings in more light that is able then to grow the next generation of of plants so um in that sense it's not always negative on the rest of the the, the things the things that aren't essentially eaten um, also like less vigilance is needed so think about you know a cheetah and a gazelle system where you have these gazelles always on the lookout for cheetahs the resident cheetah you know might be stalking the herd at all times but after that cheetah catches a gazelle and gets its tummy all full of gazelle meat um, that cheetah is going to go and rest and nap for a couple days because uh, cheetahs are well known to just gorge on their prey so they get super huge tummies and like f will eat pretty much the whole thing and then they can't basically move for a couple days and that is um, it's kind of good for the gazelles right because they know they know that their buddy just got eaten so they know that they have at least a couple days of rest where the local cheetahs don't ne won't necessarily be um, running after them and chasing them so there's a question of are prey actually controlled by predators okay we know that there are um, you know lots of predatory interactions but are the populations of prey actually controlled by predators and this is kind of part of that equilibrium versus non-equilibrium um, debate that was debated from you know for 30 40 years and still is somewhat um, up for debate right now um, but uh, when we think of invasive species we see that you know invasive species oftentimes show that prey populations can for sure be controlled by predators so there's the story of this prickly pear okay and prickly pear uh, we can find it here in Wisconsin in certain areas um, in localized dry areas but there it's a relatively um, it, it's a cactus right uh, it's and it grows in relatively arid areas but um, they have these like paddles um, and you know they're very spiny so nothing really wants to eat them uh, and then um, actually humans can eat them but uh, and they're common in um, Mexican food but animals don't really eat them and um, they were introduced in the early 20th century into Australia and made these huge um, areas where that was pretty much the entire understory or the entire area was just covered over in these prickly pear cactuses and that was pretty tough because a lot of people were concerned that their whole continent was just going to be one big prickly pear um, cactus patch and so what they did was they brought in the cactus moth and I really like its name it is called Cactoblastus um, and it's very apt because this is the same picture you see this C16 sign you see this tree right here and then this tree with that um, you know Y shape right there and you can see here's that C16 sign here's that first tree here's that Y shaped tree and this picture was taken in 1926 the Cactoblastus moth was um, I forget when it was introduced it was in the late 20s and what we see is it pretty much came in and completely annihilated this um, prickly pear patch uh, what happens is the, the the moth lays its eggs on on the cactus and the little larvae come out and um, chew kind of a bunch of holes through the cactus leaves uh, the cactus petals and then infection can get into those um, those petals and kill off the cactus um, and so this shows that you know without the predator this prickly pear cactus went crazy um, it didn't there was nothing controlling it um, and when we added the predator it actually did do a good job and to this day now we see yes prickly pear still exists in Australia but in relatively known low numbers and it's kind of like a little cat and mouse game a little 
um, a small patch of prickly pear will pop up somewhere and then finally the the moth will find it um, you know a little bit later maybe a year or two later and wipe it out and then there'll be a new um, there'll be a new patch somewhere else so are prey controlled by predators well there is certain evidence and there's lots of evidence with a lot of invasive species that yes it does work there are predators do control prey but um, and this the evidence of you know just in non-invasive situations is kind of hard to find um, the, but if the answer to this question is no there's a really intriguing thing of why are there so many anti-predator adaptations okay uh, we'll go over some of those here in a minute but what we see is that a um, or organisms have all sorts of behavioral, chemical, structural, um, anti-predator ad adaptations um, that work really well. So this is um, kind of like an evolutionary based argument where if predator populations never really controlled prey, we wouldn't expect these anti-predator adaptations to evolve. Uh, and what we can see is predation is just such an extremely strong agent of selection. So when natural selection is going, um, you know, predators getting eaten really, really limits your fitness, right? So for a plant, it might not be that bad, but for an animal, it's extremely bad. Um, so when we compare like the strength of the, of anti-predator adaptations to the strength of competitive adaptations um, it's it's very clear that predation is is really strong and can have a really big effect because the anti-predator adaptations are oftentimes much more stronger much more sophisticated and way more effective than you would expect for um, or, or then when you compare them to the competitive adaptations. So yeah, just anti-predator adaptations just work so, so much better. All right, with that, we'll come back to thinking about um, some of these defenses that we see.